Thank you to the Academy for this honor of honors. They told me I only have 45 seconds up here, which is 45 seconds more than the Senate gave John Bolton this week. Cringe. I could, of course, have chosen from a plethora of long and cringier moments, but I thought I would spare you. You already know what I'm talking about. In the past few years, we all watched and cringed as Hollywood stars made asses of themselves, using their platforms to preach to us on political and social issues. For some reason, they seem to think that their opinion on these issues matters to us. This attitude has also found its way into Hollywood movies, many of which seem to make it a point to try and educate us to be better people. Most of us just shrug and nod our head, except for some conservatives who are worried about it, because they, just like the Hollywood people, think that Hollywood has an effect on our mind and can change our culture. In this video, we are going to discuss why they think this way, why they are right that Hollywood used to be a transformative force in our culture, why their interpretation of how it was transformative is wrong, and why, because they are wrong, they don't get that Hollywood doesn't have that power anymore. Before we get to it, however, let's talk a bit about YouTube, and about this channel. It seems that Google wants to kill this channel, like many other channels in the political sphere. If you do a Google search for Zarathustra Serpent on a PC, you will not find a link to it. You can't find it on Android. Someone like Sargon of Akkad cannot be found on Android either, so I guess Sargon is in a lower level of YouTube hell than I am. This is why a lot of YouTubers open their videos by asking you to become patrons, and share their videos around. I don't like to do that, because I treat my vids as works of art, and I don't like to taint them with things that aren't relevant. I only do it here because it will become relevant later. In the past I used to make videos dedicated to asking for patronage, in which I would satirize antisemitism by telling you how we Jews are going to use this money to take over the world. Well, YouTube has now removed these videos, and gave me a strike for hate speech. These are dark times, and until the internet video is recognized as a serious art form that needs to be protected, we will just have to endure and find ways around it. I'm considering opening another channel, which will be less political. In the meantime, you can help me by becoming patrons. If not, please like, share and comment on this video, and my other videos. Alright, enough about how Silicon Valley sucks. Let's talk about how Hollywood sucks. This is after all what you pay me for. But you already know what you're gonna get for your money. I can't talk about it without first giving you a long history lecture. So let's go back to when it started, about a hundred years ago, when Hollywood was the first to turn long feature movies into an industry. This coincided with the rise of the US as a global superpower, a rise that rested mainly on its financial and military might. But if you want to dominate on the global stage, those aren't enough. You have to dominate the culture as well. And it was mainly thanks to cinema, the first artistic medium to be associated with America, that the US achieved its cultural global supremacy. The silent movie was the first truly global form of art, because it transcended the barriers of language, and showed scenes of regular people that everyone in the civilized world could identify with. By the time the talkies took over in the late twenties, Hollywood was already the capital of cinema, and continued to set the tone. By the thirties, the effect of Hollywood on the general population was obvious, and the establishment got scared. Hollywood was flouting traditional American values, and conservatives called to censor it. But what about the liberals, those who are supposed to protect the freedom of art? Well, they were also on board with the censorship. Why? Simple, they did not consider cinema as art. This is how the cultural elites usually see the world. First, they basically believe that while they are capable of free thinking, the masses are incapable of thinking for themselves and this is why it is incumbent upon them to be the gatekeepers of culture. Secondly, they believe that one thing that proves it is that while they enjoy high art, which is very profound and promotes lofty values, the masses are mindlessly consuming crass popular culture. Left-wing elitists usually believe that pop culture is created by the capitalist system in order to keep the proletariat docile and blind to the fact that the system is exploiting them. Right-wing elitists usually believe that the popular culture is created by degenerate people, who are trying to corrupt the masses and undermine traditional values. 
In contrast, they endorse high art. The right-wing elitists believe that high art is art that works within traditional values. But only the high art of the past is good. Today's high art has been corrupted by the aforementioned corrupting forces, and is therefore meaningless rubbish. Left-wing elitists, on the other hand, believe that high art is created by geniuses who are misunderstood in their time, and only later get recognition while the popular culture of their time fades away into obscurity. This is why they eulogize contemporary high art, the kind of art that nobody but them cares about, believing that one day they will be vindicated. When you actually look at the history of art and culture, a completely different picture arises. The popular mediums, because they have no pretensions and are open to anyone to try their ideas, are the fields where geniuses arise. Most consumers of popular culture consume it just for entertainment value, and most artists working in these mediums are mere entertainers. But the consumers also know that there are some works that go deeper than mere entertainment. They touch you on a deeper level, and transform you. At first, the creators of these works are also regarded as mere entertainers, since they are working in a popular medium. And they are quite popular, though usually not as much as the pure entertainers. But the works generate a discussion, and some critics are able to put the discussion in intellectual terms. This eventually leads to a new aesthetical perception, one that makes it possible to perceive this medium not just as entertainment, but as art. Then, these creators start to be celebrated as geniuses who created a new form, and are elevated above the mere entertainers. At this point, the medium is still popular, and most people still consume it for entertainment. But there are also creators and consumers who regard it as an art form, and the medium becomes respectable. After a few decades more, it finally detaches completely from pop culture and becomes high art, and the public forgets that it was ever perceived as entertainment. And then, the elitist culture guardians portray the aforementioned geniuses as true artists, ones who did not work in a popular form but chose an artistic medium, and only those with refined taste could recognize their genius. Usually, they will also quote things that were said about them by their contemporaries to show how misunderstood they were ignoring the fact that these contemporaries were actually the culture guardian elitists of that time. Let's take just one example. In the year 1790, Immanuel Kant published his philosophical work Critique of Judgment, and in one segment he ranks the artistic mediums from the highest to the lowest. On top he puts poetry, as the highest form of art, while the lowest rank is given to music, which he describes as not much more than mere entertainment. And this, to remind you, was written in 1790, after two decades in which Haydn and Mozart created masterpiece after masterpiece, and as a young Beethoven was already composing his first works. And yet, Kant's view was the prevailing view among the elites at the time. Why is that? Because in the perception of the 18th century, God has created the world in which the true, the good and the beautiful are one and the same, and man's mission was to become part of this divine harmony. Art, appealing to both the mind and the emotions, was there to represent the divine order, and help us achieve this harmony with the world and within ourselves. But music was seen as affecting the emotions alone, and therefore as something that remains on the earthly level and doesn't transcend to the divine plane. Thus, as beautiful and moving as it could be, those educated elites could not regard it as high art. But music had its avid fans, including some educated people. And then, the belief in the ability of the human mind to figure out the divine order was shaken, and some started looking for other ways to reach the truth. By the 1810s, some intellectuals were portraying music as a representative of the sublime, the truth that is beyond the grasp of our mind, and therefore as the highest form of art. Thus, once these ideas took hold, music helped to reshape our perception of reality, and profoundly changed our culture. For these intellectuals, it was the music of Beethoven, which wasn't very popular until then because it was seen as too wild and unrestrained, that best represented this ideal, while the music of Mozart was still mostly regarded as light entertainment. Music then entered the phase in which a medium becomes what I call serious art. That is, a medium that already takes itself seriously as an art form, but is still popular and connected to popular culture. In this capacity, music was one of the driving forces of modern progress and all the social and intellectual changes that it entailed. In the middle of the 19th century, 
the music world split into classical music and popular music. It happened because classical music aficionados started to distance themselves from the more popular contemporary forms, and quarantined themselves in concert halls. It was then that Mozart was elevated to the rank of a genius, and the classical music fans started to portray him as an artist who was misunderstood in his time and died poor, and Beethoven as someone who was disliked by most music fans. The implication is that it is the uneducated masses, those who like popular music, who didn't get how profound their art was, while the elites did. This disregards the fact that no one at the time took them seriously as artists, because all music was regarded as nothing but popular entertainment. By early 20th century, classical music detached completely from popular culture and became what I call high art. High art is consumed mostly by the elites and they completely buy into the story that it was never a popular form, but rather a form driven by geniuses who single-handedly changed the world with their art. Because they believe it has such power, they also fight to maintain its purity. Fascist and communist regimes allowed only certain forms of classical music to be written and performed, believing that this keeps it pure and fosters the right spirit in the public, while the liberal elites fought to keep it completely free, believing that this will produce new geniuses. But this fight didn't matter. By that time, classical music lost its power to affect culture. It was actually American pop music that undermined the totalitarian regimes, and broke their conditioning of the subjects' minds. This is around the time that cinema was getting censored, but in the case of cinema, there were no liberal elites who tried to protect its artistic freedom. Now we can understand why. The liberal elites agreed with the right-wing cultural guardians, and with the totalitarian regimes, that cinema is nothing but crass entertainment, and has no artistic merit. They all recognize that it has power over people, but since there was still no intellectual way to understand the art of it, they thought that its power comes from gratifying our baser instincts, and therefore should be censored. When the elites want to muzzle a popular medium, the reason is always the same. It corrupts the youth, and thus destroys the social order and leads to anarchy. Every ill that society suffers from at the time then gets blamed on that popular medium. In ancient Athens it was philosophical discussions that became popular, so eventually they got blamed for the social upheavals that overtook the city, and the philosopher Socrates was executed on the charge that he corrupted the youth. Today it is YouTube that gets the blame for all bad things, and we YouTubers feel the brunt of censorship. In the 1920s and 30s it was cinema, and Hollywood had to agree to censor itself adopting what was known as the Hayes Code. For decades, you could not see nudity, blood, foul language, sexual acts, sexually deviant identities, and other naughty stuff, in any Hollywood movie. But the elites never get it. Because they don't understand the art of the new popular medium, they also don't understand the way it affects the consumers. When it came to Hollywood cinema, it wasn't so much about the plot, but about the characters. On the big screen, the Hollywood stars were larger than life, and the ability of movie cameras to close up on their faces burned those faces deep into our collective psyche. Hollywood stars would play the same character in every movie, and became a new type of hero. They were not demigods, they were not men of noble blood, but regular people who had the ability to shine on the screen and present archetypes that the common folk would emulate. And people all over the world emulated them to express their own personalities and develop their attitude towards life. Thus, Hollywood projected and exported the values of American pop culture around the globe, values that were very different from the values that the elites were trying to advance. The elites were still busy with the European-born project of enlightenment, which aimed at creating a perfect world. They saw the masses as a body that needed to be educated and molded into a civilized and enlightened society. The high art of the time reflected this state of mind. But Hollywood cinema had no such pretensions. What the stars presented was models of existence in the modern free society, which is already good enough and doesn't need to be perfected. They gave the common folk the attitude needed to resist the attempts of the elites to mold them. This is what 20th century pop culture was about, and it undermined the project of enlightenment, a project which has by then lost all of its positive aspects, and evolved into the totalitarian regimes and their atrocities. Those who follow this channel know that I call this age the Pop Age, and divide it into three periods. The first period, from the mid-1910s to the mid-1960s, is what I call the Hollywood period. This is the period that I just discussed, 
the period when Hollywood cinema dominated pop culture and changed the world. Other prominent pop mediums of that period were radio, comic books and jazz music. This is also the transitional phase between the modern age, the age that was dominated by the idea of the progress of man towards a perfect society, and the pop age, which was undermining it. The mid-1950s saw the beginning of the second period, which I call the rock and roll period. In this period, pop music usurped cinema as the center of pop culture, and while the Hollywood period was when the common working class folks got to have their say, in the rock and roll period it was the youth that was the main driving force. Why the youth? Well, first of all, this was the first generation of teenagers that had money to spend, so they could determine what they wanted to consume. But also, this was a generation that felt that the modern paradigm no longer held any merit. The pop culture of the Hollywood period did not buy into the modern dream of progress towards utopia, but also did not rebel against it. The rock and roll youth, born after two world wars, felt this dream to be meaningless, oppressive and deadly, and rebelled. Instead of working for an ideal future, the youth sought elation in the here and now, through ecstatic music. From the mid-50s onward, Every new generation of kids would rebel against what came before, and create a new ecstatic style of music, which would be the basis of a new group identity. Another medium that belongs to this period is television, which sapped a lot of the power from cinema and radio. One of the things that gave cinema its power in the Hollywood period is that going to the movies was a day out, in which along with the main feature you would also watch newsreels, documentaries, serials, cartoons, second features and more. Between the mid-50s and the mid-60s, the transitional phase between the Hollywood period and the rock and roll period, all of this was transferred to the small screen, leaving cinemas to play the movie alone. Similarly, things that were fixtures of radio programming, such as sitcoms and soap operas, were annexed by television. In the mid-50s, it was believed that it was only a matter of time before radio would become redundant and disappear. But exactly because of that, Radio was no longer regulated as tightly as it was in the Hollywood period, and so it could become a platform for subversive expression. The so-called personality disc jockeys emerged and became cultural heroes, and started to promote new musical styles and ideas. And another new form of self-expression was stand-up comedy, in which the comedian no longer just told jokes, but provided social and political commentary on every aspect of reality. Like the rock musicians, the stand-up comedians put their performances out on records, and became cultural heroes who challenged the prevailing cultural norms. What were the elites up to at that time? Well, once it sank in that the project of enlightenment is a road to nowhere, they latched on to the individualism that was embodied by pop culture in the Hollywood period, moving away from the welfare state of the 50s to the neoliberal hypercapitalism of the 80s. Meanwhile, Pop culture left behind both universalism and individualism, and focused on group identities. Its rebellion wasn't a me against the world thing, but an us against the world, as individuals grouped together in rock bands, youth subcultures, geek communities, and minority congregations. Through pop music, all these different identity groups could express themselves. Bands would form within the community and express its worldview, and once they became popular, they would be signed by a record label and go mainstream, and then they could get this world on the airwaves, for the whole world to hear. Politically, this manifested itself mainly in the fight for minority rights. The modern age was about the progress of man, but this man was in the image of the straight white male, and this made everyone else secondary. Now, ethnic minorities, sexual minorities, and women started to demand to be treated equally, and through pop culture, they got their voices heard, and changed our consciousness. What role did Hollywood play in all of this? Well, between the mid-50s and the mid-60s, the transitional phase between the periods, the old Hollywood system was declining, and the light of the Hollywood stars began to diminish. Once you saw them on the small screen, they didn't look so godly anymore. In the Hollywood period, the studios put a lot of effort in keeping the stars out of reach, away from the public's eye, to maintain their aura. Now that the television cameras and the paparazzi were everywhere, it was no longer possible. The actors had to adjust, and find a new role to play in a world ruled by rock stars, personality DJs and stand-up comedians, and they did it by joining them. By the late 60s, 
Hollywood re-emerged and reasserted its place in pop culture. One thing that enabled this comeback was that cinema was now regarded as serious art. This happened mainly thanks to European movie directors, critics and intellectuals, who started to focus on the artistic side of movie making. It began in the 50s, and by the late 60s had its effect on American cinema. The actors no longer played the same character in every movie, and no longer embodied archetypes of humanity. They were now prized for their acting abilities, adopting what was known as method acting. For method actors, cinema was a serious matter, a matter of life and death, and they would risk life and limb to portray the perfect role, or even just get the perfect shot. Because they threw themselves into the art with such commitment, they became cultural heroes. And with such power, they could also represent their group identity. They were no longer glamorized beyond belief, but looked like regular people that you could identify with. True, they lived in the Hollywood bubble, and were not connected to their generation or their minority group like the musicians were. But they were more connected than anyone else among the elites, and since they could present their group identity as attractive and charismatic, they became representatives, spokespersons and heroes to these groups. Thus, they became important social and political figures, and we cared about what they had to say. But when the Europeans discussed cinema as art, it actually wasn't the actors that they were talking about, but the directors. In the Hollywood period, the director was just part of the machine, there to direct actors according to a script written by someone else, and then hand the footage over to an editor. The Europeans demanded that the director would be the auteur, the artist who is in control of every aspect in the creation of the movie, and the movie should express their own vision. In the rock and roll period, when cinema was regarded as serious art, the movie director became the epitome of an artist. The director was an individual genius, and that's something that the elites could understand. In the movies, the directors would dramatize all the different philosophical, social and political questions of the time, affecting the way we view the world. When a medium starts to be regarded as serious art, it starts to be protected by the elites, and its freedom of expression is guarded. The Hayes Code was lifted in the 60s, giving directors full artistic freedom. On the downside, this is also when the Academy starts to take interest in it. You very rarely read anything worthwhile coming from the Academy about a popular medium. Academics usually have an elitist perspective, and they believe in the myth of the genius artist who shares their values, and educates the uncivilized masses. And so, eventually the Academy produced hordes of filmmakers and critics who grew up on this myth, and want to use the power of cinema to change the world. This is the moment that we are in now. Alas, in the meantime, the rock and roll period came to an end. As mentioned, I mark its beginning in the mid-1950s, and its end came in the mid-2000s. Once it ended, Cinema no longer means what it used to, and actors and directors no longer become cultural heroes. The last director I can think of who became a hero of this type was Christopher Nolan, and he made his mark in the early 2000s. Since then, no one. And no actors either. Why is that? Well, because the mid-90s saw the beginning of a new period in the pop age, which I call the cyber period. It was brought about mainly by the advent of the home computer and the World Wide Web. Suddenly, we don't need musicians, actors, DJs and stand-up comedians to be our representative spokespersons or symbols. We use computers to connect to each other, and to express ourselves to the world. Nowadays, millions of people find some degree of fame online, and the distinction between a regular person and a star is no longer clear. We don't even call them stars anymore. We call them influencers. The new Hollywood actors are forced to play by these new rules, to have a presence in the social media, and as a result, what aura the Hollywood stars had left is now completely gone. They are now on the same level as the rest of us, and we can all see just how out of touch they are. Furthermore, the main effect that computers had on the art of cinema is CGI, and one of the results of CGI is that movie making is not a matter of life and death anymore. No one would risk their life for a great shot when you can just achieve the same effect with CGI. And so, actors are no longer regarded as heroes. Now, because the cyber period was brought about by computers, it put the nerds on top, and the pop culture of today is based on nerd mediums, 
like video games, fantasy literature and comic books. And when internet communities formed around the worlds presented in these stories and games, they expanded them. What was once a fantasy that was the brainchild of one creator has been turned into a mythology, where many writers add to the world that they created. And when different mediums start to appropriate this mythology, what is formed is a universe. Meanwhile, television has become serious art, and its ability to create long stories makes it more suitable to this universe-based pop culture. Hollywood had to adjust, to start thinking of movies not as standalone pieces, but as part of a universe which also spans TV shows, comics, video games, books and more. The old idea of the auteur, the movie director is an artist in full control, no longer captures our imagination. The result of all this is that cinema is turning into high art. It is taken very seriously, but loses touch with pop culture. We don't feel it yet, as there are still very popular movies, but one sign that the medium is turning into high art is when there is a split between its arty side and its commercial side. Today, those movie makers and critics who came from the academy are still thinking of cinema in the old terms, and looking for movies that come from the personal vision of the director. Meanwhile, the online discussion completely ignores this type of movies, and discusses only those movies that are part of universes. The latter are still very popular, but once video games get to a point where they can offer a more immersive and spectacular experience in a movie, I expect cinema will go the way of classical music, plastic arts, and all those other mediums that became high art and nowadays interest only a niche audience. If we go back to the onset of the cyber period, to the year 1995, and check what were the nominees for Best Picture in the Oscars that year, we will find that it was The Shawshank Redemption, Forrest Gump, Pulp Fiction, Four Weddings and a Funeral, and The Quiz Show. All movies that were both critically acclaimed and the box office smash, and most of them continue to resonate in our culture even today. If we check out this year's nominees, the only movie that had such a cultural impact is Joker, and Joker is an anomaly in today's Hollywood. Most Oscar nominees in recent years have been movies that most people haven't even heard of. This is how you know it's turning into high art. When a medium becomes high art, the censorship returns. But it is a different kind of censorship. When it is seen as a pop medium, the elite censor it because they are afraid it will corrupt the youth. When it is high art, they censor it because they believe it has the responsibility to shape the way the public thinks. So it isn't about telling movie makers what they are not allowed to do, but about telling them what they should do. Since they believe high art is the thing that shapes people's minds, they believe it can be used as a tool to spread their ideology. What is the ideology of the elites in the cyber period? Well, they have adopted the identity politics that dominated pop culture in the rock and roll period. But in pop culture, identity politics meant different identities battling and conversing with each other in the public sphere until they found a way to coexist. The elites, coming to it only after we basically solved all the major identity problems, are looking at the inequities of the past, since the past is what academics look at, and telling themselves that the problem is that the masses are bigoted and need to be educated. And so, they try to use cinema to teach us not to be bigoted. And this is how we get to today, when you have Hollywood people who grew up on the myths of Hollywood's past culture heroes, and think that what they say matters. They didn't get the memo that they don't matter anymore. I am not a cynical person, and I believe most of them are driven by their good side. They honestly feel that since they were lucky, they have to give something back to the world, and help make it a better place. Unfortunately, since they are detached from the public, they take their cues from the elite class, who are driven by identity politics and social justice ideology. And so, instead of making the world better by simply using their gift to make movies that will bring joy to millions, they are out there making cringy comments about social and political issues. This really kicked into high gear following the election of Donald Trump. Hollywood, now a hub of self-righteousness and of belief in the power of cinema to change the world for good, vowed to fight in the name of morality against this president who was elected by the uneducated and bigoted masses. But what they forgot, riding on the myth that Hollywood changed the world because it was always a paragon of high art and liberal values, is that for a century Hollywood was actually the capital of debauchery. Everything they threw at Trump immediately came back to bite them in the ass. Most of all, the Me Too movement. 
Me too went after the people we always knew were there, and it was about time they got their comeuppance. But it happened not only because Hollywood became self-righteous. The reason why Hollywood predators weren't dealt with before is that everyone benefited from the system that allowed them to thrive. Before the cyber period, if a beautiful woman wanted to use her looks to become famous, she could do so by being an actress, a model or a singer. If you made it, you became a sex symbol, the ultimate sexual fantasy, with all the riches that came with it. Naturally, this meant that Hollywood was flooded with numerous hotties hungry for fame, and willing to do anything to achieve it. And this invited many men who sought to take advantage. These were the rules of the game, and everyone was playing. I tried to think back on the decade that just ended, and remember which actresses became sex symbols. The only names I could think of who did it through movies are Jennifer Lawrence, Margot Robbie and Gal Gadot, and the only ones who did it through TV are Sofia Vergara and Emilia Clarke. In contrast, here is a partial list of actresses who became sex symbols, in movies and TV, in the 1990s. You can make a similar list for every decade before the last one, stretching back to the 1920s. What changed? Well, nowadays you don't need to go through the showbiz system to become famous on your looks. If you are a super hot chick, you can find fame and fortune on Instagram. If you have a talent, you can succeed on YouTube. And if you are just reasonably hot and not very talented, you can be a gamer on Twitch. The casting couch is no longer necessary, and with that came less tolerance to predatory men in Hollywood, resulting in the Me Too movement. Every medium goes through this process. When it is popular, it is where people go to look for sexual arousal. When it becomes high art, it starts to frown on displays of sexuality, seeing them as no more than vulgar gratification. In the rock and roll period, men would sit through a boring movie just for the chance of seeing some boobs. Nowadays, they can see all the boobs they want on the internet, so you can't draw them to the movie theaters with sex. I've been talking about the elites in general, but of course, they are not a monolith. There are right-wing elites and left-wing elites, and within the left we are seeing two main approaches. The liberal elites see themselves as gatekeepers of liberal values, because they regard the common masses as the liberal boots. But then there is a social justice movement, the woke brigade, who are anti-liberal. It is a different kind of elitism. The liberal elites believe that personally they are able to think for themselves, but the masses cannot and therefore need to be guided. The woke elites believe that none of us can think for ourselves, since our minds are shaped by the patriarchy. What makes them superior, and therefore elite, is that they recognize the existence of the patriarchy, and work to bring it down. This difference is manifested in the Me Too movement. It started out as wanting to get justice for women who were victimized, but once the woke got involved, the movement was transformed. Men are being blamed and hounded with no regard for due process, because the idea is no longer to bring wrongdoers to justice, it is to bring down the patriarchy, by bringing down strong men. And once this approach took over, Hollywood started to eat itself. The woke are also trying to affect changes in the art of movie making. They believe that movies shape the minds of the viewers, so they are demanding movies that will shape our minds according to their social justice ideology. The liberal elites who are running Hollywood are trying to placate them, and so we get some woke movies. But they have it wrong. The public are not mindless sheep who are being shaped by the movies, but people who know what they want, and at the moment the general public is actually more liberally minded than the elites, and the public is rejecting these movies. You would expect Hollywood to get the message by now, which might make you wonder why they keep making these movies. But you have to remember that a movie takes a long time to make. The movies that are being released now were conceived back in 2017-2018. Don't worry, the message of Get Woke Go Broke is being heard, loud and clear, and will bring change. I suspect the actors will also be told by the studio to shut up already. Hollywood will overcome this cringy moment but it will never go back to what it was, for the reasons that we discussed. So you really shouldn't worry that the SJWs will spread their ideology through Hollywood. This fear is quite prevalent in right-wing circles, and this is because the right also misunderstands the dynamics of pop culture. When I listen to conservatives talk about culture, what I keep hearing in the background is the old notion of the fall of man, 
the idea that we could be better if we weren't corrupted by culture. They believed that pop culture is to blame for the destruction of traditional values, because it corrupted our character and our spirituality by giving us art that gratifies our base urges. I hope that I showed you that the traditional values of today were the youth corrupting pop culture of the past, and that the pop culture of today holds just as much spirituality as it always did. All of this may seem discouraging, when you realize that every new generation has to go through the same crap of censorship. But notice the other process that is occurring here. Gradually, the elites are losing their grip on power. In the 18th century, the aristocracy and the clergy were the ones in power, and commissioned artists to provide the art that they wanted. In the 19th century, the bourgeoisie became the new elites, and since they believed that individualism is a virtue, they gave more freedom to the artists. But since the bourgeoisie owned all the platforms, artists also couldn't stray too far from their values if they wanted to be heard. Furthermore, you usually needed some initial wealth if you wanted to become a famous artist. In the Hollywood period, as common folk now had money to consume art, commoners could find fame as well, for instance by becoming movie and recording stars, catering to these masses. But before you even got there, you still had to go through talent scouts, agents, trainers, producers, and other people who would prep you for it. In the rock and roll period we took another step forward. You no longer needed a middleman, as you could find local fame by singing to your community, and then be signed by a recording label and achieve global fame. So you still needed the record company, owned by the elites, to get a global platform. In the cyber period, we done away with that as well. You can achieve global fame right away, by directly connecting to a global audience. So the common man has more power to express himself, but the downside is that a small number of elites suddenly have a lot of power over the artist. When you had to go through a lot of people to achieve fame, there was at least a chance that some of them would believe in you and fight for you. Today, Silicon Valley provides the platform, and it can take it away. So we are dependent on a small group that has a very narrow-minded ideology. One of the missions of Freedom Fighters in the next few years will be to create alternatives to Silicon Valley. The fact that the elites are censoring us just shows that YouTube now matters more than Hollywood. The elites, as always, are trying to shape our thinking. But, as always, they don't realize where our mind is at.